locomotive is a vital factor in the development of civilization. In a little over a century, railways using steam power have opened up the great continents and rendered possible the distribution of the wealth of the earth. The steam locomotive is a robust and self-contained power unit. It is efficient and one of the most economical prime movers to operate and with a long working life gives almost trouble-free service. In addition to steam locomotives, British locomotive manufacturers are producing many varied types, such as diesel mechanical, diesel electric and electric locomotives, whilst considerable research is being carried out on gas turbine propulsion. Over a hundred years ago, British engineers were pioneers of railways and of steam locomotive creation and development. Though there had been much thought and some work done on locomotives during the latter half of the 18th century, the first success of steam on rails was attained by Richard Trevithick with a locomotive built in Cornwall in 1803. In 1812, Blenkinsop completed an engine driven by gear wheels along a racked track for Middleton Colliery. Many engineers and colliery owners became interested in the possibilities of steam traction and a variety of designs were put forward. One famous example of this period was Headley's Puffing Billy built in 1813 for Wylam Colliery. In 1814, George Stevenson, profiting by the work already done, built his first locomotive for Killingworth Colliery. Aided by his son Robert, the firm of Robert Stevenson Company was founded, and their first locomotive, built in 1825, was named Locomotion No. 1. This was made for the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the first public railway in the world. By now, interest was fully aroused, and it was decided to hold a trial for the best design. This was held at Rain Hill, near Liverpool, in 1829. The competitors were Novelty, a four-wheeled locomotive with vertical boil cylinders, Saint Paré, a four-coupled engine with a vertical cylinder on each side, Perseverance, a beam engine with vertical cylinders driven by steam from a flash boiler, and the rocket, designed by George Stevenson. The latter was of revolutionary design, with cylinders at 40 degrees, and a large heating service being obtained by the use of a multi-tubular boiler, the first ever fitted to a locomotive. The rocket was the only competitor to complete the trial successfully and George Stevenson was awarded the prize. The steam locomotive thus passed from the experimental to the evolutionary stage. In 1830, the Robert Stevenson Company produced the Planet, answering the demand for increased power and speed. Amongst other improvements, the cylinders were lowered almost to horizontal. Throughout this period, foreign engineers had been visiting Britain, and as a result, in the early 1830s, the first locomotives were being delivered to overseas railways. Sister engines, the Samson and the Goliath, had four coupled wheels for freight work over increased gradients. Single pairs of driving wheels remained for passenger work in locomotives of ever-increasing power, typified by the Don Lewis, an export model. And by the late 1850s, British locomotives formed the basis of design throughout the world and were the first to operate in almost every country, including the United States of America. As the years passed and weights of trains increased, four coupled wheels had to be adopted for passenger traffic. And by the close of the century, trains in Britain were running at speeds little inferior to those of today. But great progress continued in efficiency and power. 
At this time, six coupled wheels were used on freight locomotives. Although the powerful modern locomotive differs greatly from its prototype of a century ago, the fundamental principles remain the same. Modifications to meet special conditions develop design so that present types emerge from the workshops equipped to meet any required tasks and conditions of service. Because their world markets contain so many different conditions, specialised design has become a fundamental practice of the British locomotive manufacturers. Consequently, the design departments of their works are very important features, as can be gathered from the small selection we show here. Over 500 draftsmen are employed in the drawing offices, where the designs for all types of locomotives, for every condition of service, are prepared, incorporating the specialised requirements of railway engineers in any part of the world. Steel, iron and non-ferrous castings are normally incorporated, and for these, coloured wooden patterns are manufactured. This universal wood milling machine is cutting out a core box for locomotive cylinders. The cylinder patterns are then mounted on plates to facilitate jolt ramming. Here's one being checked. Jolt ramming is a modern and effective method of securing uniform density of sand throughout the mould, with consequently little or no variation in the weight of the finished castings. Most moulds are stoved, cores placed in position and then carefully closed in preparation for casting. In this great moulding shop, six tonnes of molten iron are brought to the cylinder mould. British locomotive builders produce iron, steel and non-ferrous castings to ensure the exact physical properties required for each component. As with iron, so also with steel. Steel is produced in their foundries in electric furnaces. Control of the quality of the steel is shared between the traditional skill of the smelter and scientific laboratory checks. completed, the furnace returns to the upright position, ready for recharging. Casting of many steel parts is supervised by expert moulders. Where suitable, steel castings are increasingly employed. castings are heat treated in parametrically controlled gas heated furnaces. The variety of parts cast may be gathered from this charge, now rapidly cooling as the rolling hearth is withdrawn from the furnace. The forges in these workshops produce forgings of the highest grade under the guidance of forgemen with a lifetime of training and experience. Here, for example, the gang is making a connecting rod from a bloom of hot steel. The hammer is striking and forming the metal into shape, aided by draw strips and shaping tools such as the V-set, until the forging acquires its final shape. The accurate control of the billet, the placing of the tools for removal of superfluous metal, the timing, power and number of hammer blows used to shape the metal are all governed by the experienced eye of the forgeman. Completed forgings are heat treated by prolonged soaking in gas heated furnaces. They are then carried to adjacent oil tanks for quenching. This heat treatment, oil hardening and tempering, ensures a refined grain structure in the steel, the required tensile breaking stress, maximum yield and the greatest resistance to the Izod impact test.
Laboratory control of casting and forging is kept at the highest standard with the latest machines for physical and analytical testing, X-ray photographic and microscopic examination of metals. The semi-automatic operation of this tensile testing machine is one example. Another is the pyramid hardness testing machine, which is of particular importance for metals used in locomotive manufacture. The diamond cut made in the sample is read by the operator, who adjusts the measuring device to the impression which he sees greatly magnified. The vernier reading of 290 degrees shows the degree of hardness of the sample. This projection microscope permits the metallurgist to study direct at 500 magnifications the grain size and general structure in the etched sample. Well-equipped chemical laboratories play their all-important part by analytical testing of metals. In this shop, a dozen or more big presses are at work, pressing out, drawing and flanging to form such parts as a firebox thrift plate, being shaped in this 800-ton multi-ram press from a flat plate of hot steel. After the first thrust of the press, the main rams are brought into action. And thrusting up from the bottom, exerts still greater pressure, thus completing the process. The rams are withdrawn, and the steel is now clearly recognizable as a firebox throat plate. The process by which a flat plate of considerable thickness is shaped in horizontal rolls into a perfect circle is part of boiler making in every locomotive works. The operation of the heavy rolls, the skill of the operator controlling and setting up the machine, so that in a matter of relatively a few minutes, a stout plate is rolled into a stouter circle is worthy of recognition. When the shell has been completely assembled, it is placed on the universal table of a shell drilling machine, where all the rivet holes are opened out in one plate and drilled from the solid in the other. The boiler casing is then slung vertically in a riveting tower. After the red-hot rivets are inserted into the holes, the heads are formed. And the rivets are closed by hydraulic pressure. Another example of a well-designed appliance is this manipulator for the welding of thermic siphons, shaped from one plate. It's a labor-saving device which also ensures the highest quality work on an important feature of many modern locomotives. In the boiler mounting shop, tubes, superheaters and mountings are fitted and hydraulic and steam tests are made. Returning to follow the progress of cylinder castings, we see that they are completely machined, fitted and most thoroughly tested. Boring machines, such as this universal number six borer, using tungsten carbide tools, ensure speedy and accurate machining. The milling of special shaped ports in piston valve liners is handled by automatic millers in which the shape of the port is controlled by a tracer jig. Similarly, in the gas cutting of frame plates or of slabs for bar frames, the shape is controlled by a tracer, bearing on a template at the rear.
this plano miller for milling frame plates or steel slabs for bar frames is typical of the huge machines in these works. Another example is this unique three-headed frame slotter, machining five slabs for bar frames. The latest type of vertical boring machine is employed for boring and facing axle boxes. The use of a color guide makes for simplicity and control. This very efficient miller employs four milling cutters operating on four coupling rods. Good layout and highly efficient equipment is the keynote of these machine shops, typified again by this horizontal surface grinder on connecting rods. And also by this double-headed vertical borer which operates through a jig, boring the holes for coupling rod bushes. The work of the individual is perhaps the more obvious in the simple task of plough polishing the flutes in connecting and coupling rods, which gives a high surface finish, facilitating examination for any local defects in the material. In the gang planing of axle boxes, four tools are operative in machines such as this. The effectiveness of the cutting tool is clearly seen. Developed solely for locomotive manufacture is this reversing link grinder. It's working on the case hardened die block paths. The triple movement essential to this work can be clearly seen. The equipment of their machine shops with highly efficient automatic machines such as this six spindle automatic is an essential part of production methods. This high speed axle turning lathe has a cutting speed of 600 feet per minute. The two cutting tools can be discerned through the flowing coolant as the axle is turned at high speed. Both ends are machined simultaneously. The note of high productivity is stressed again in tower boring. The latest types of tower borers are employed, 60 tons of steel being bored at 500 feet per minute. Into the erecting shops converge the results of all these operations. The frames gradually emerge as complete locomotives, to which saddles are bolted and cylinders then swung into and carefully adjusted to the frame. Boilers are clothed with lagging. Smoke boxes and components added. And the hundreds of parts varying in size and numbers according to type all find their particular place in the assembly. Gradually, the assembly becomes recognizable as a locomotive, and the wheels are carefully aligned, ready for the assembled boiler and frame to be lowered into position. Some idea of the size of the erecting shops and of the job they do can be gathered from this assembly being carried down the shop over the top of the many locomotives being erected there. Lowering is slow work as the axle boxes have only a fractional clearance in the guide and they must all engage squarely. This spectacular operation is repeated with the boiler assembly of a powerful Garrett articulated locomotive, one of the largest types in the world. of the gauges and controls on the boiler is obtained as the cab of a locomotive is lowered into position. 
This apparatus enables one operator to complete the entire cycle of valve setting without assistance, as the delicate accuracy afforded by remote control on the drum mechanism permits him to work with speedy efficiency. Valve setting is possibly the most important single operation in the whole course of erection, because the development of maximum power and efficient running depends upon it. locomotive is now ready for steam testing. And after a warning blast on the whistle, its driving wheels revolve under its own steam. Inspection of all motion parts is made to ensure smooth, reciprocating action. The coupling rods are then fitted, and the locomotive leaves the shops for the first time under its own steam for the paint shop. This work is going on in a dozen large works, premises of locomotive manufacturers spread over Great Britain. In these erecting shops, literally scores of locomotives are being continuously erected. Extensive though these shops are, the locomotives undergoing erection are packed pretty closely together, for space is at a premium. Multiple erection lines are general in each erection shop. Some idea of the size of these erecting shops may be obtained from this view of one of them, taken from a travelling overhead crane. The unsteadiness of the picture is due to crane vibration, but it is included because it shows a remarkable view of two-thirds the length of one shop. The scale and variety of the British locomotive industry is best demonstrated by its production of a thousand steam locomotives of many different types a year. These works employ 15,000 men and women, many of them being the third and fourth generation in the industry. This is one of the modern erecting shops devoted entirely to electric and diesel locomotives, for the industry has developed powerful, reliable and fast diesel mechanical and diesel electric locomotives for countries where fuel oil is cheap and water supply is poor. British manufacturers give the greatest attention to every development of traction likely to be of advantage to their customers. They have developed many complex but economic locomotives, diesel mechanical for industrial haulage, compact, flame-proof diesels for underground mines operation. The output in this category is large and varied. 1,600 horsepower diesel electrics for fast passenger and heavy freight work are also produced. And locomotives for every condition and purpose. As, for example, this wood-burning two-foot six-gauge type. Articulated locomotives of enormous power were pioneered in Great Britain for fast passenger and heavy freight haulage over very difficult country. Many versions of the crane locomotive, such as this special purpose steam industrial type, fitted with a turbo generator and electromagnet. and a fireless locomotive for haulage in chemical works, oil cracking plants and similar undertakings. And of course, almost numberless versions of the made of all work, the purely industrial shunting engine are produced.
While some are dismantled and crated for reassembly in the country of operation, the majority are conveyed by rail or road to the docks, where, separated from their tenders, they are swung aboard. Grouped alongside on the docks, the number waiting shipment gives some idea of the productivity of this industry. All over the world, on every continent, British-built locomotives, products of inherited skill, traditional engineering and practical inventiveness are doing the work because they are built to do the job economically and are planned individually to specifications suiting local requirements. The British industry values its history and record of over 125 years, but it is even prouder of its progress in which the traditions of technical skill and engineering efficiency are combined with practical innovation and invention, modern machinery, up-to-date appliances and equipment, and the latest technology. Many features such as bar frames, steel fire boxes, poppet valve gears, mechanical stokers, etc., normally associated with overseas practice, are embodied in numerous British designs. Many of them, in fact, originated in Great Britain. While the fitting of ball and roller bearings, rocking grates of all types, hopper ash pans, self-cleaning smoke boxes, and other specialities reveal the attention given to the operational point of view. The Locomotive Manufacturers Association of Great Britain exists for mutual cooperation on many problems, but all the firms freely compete. In Britain, the cradle of locomotive engineering, the inheritors of a progressive tradition are building modern locomotives of ever-increasing power, efficiency and reliability. In short, the locomotives of tomorrow. <laughs>